Hero and Leander by Christopher Marlowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Hero and Leander by Christopher Marlowe. The First Cestian. On Hellespont, guilty of true love's blood, in view and opposite, two cities stood sea borderers disjoined by neptune's might the one abidos the other cestus height at cestus hero dwelt hero the fair whom young apollo courted for her hair and offered as a dower his burning throne where she should sit for men to gaze upon the outside of her garments were of lawn the lining purple silk with gilt stars drawn her wide sleeves green and bordered with a grove where venus in her naked glory strove to please the careless and disdainful eyes a proud adonis that before her lies her kirtle blue whereon was many a stain made with the blood of wretched lovers slain upon her head she wear a myrtle wreath from whence her veil reached to the ground beneath her veil was artificial flowers and leaves whose workmanship both man and beast deceives Many would praise the sweet smell as she passed, when t'was the odor which her breath forth cast. And there, for honey, bees have sought in vain, and beat from thence have lighted there again. About her neck hung chains of pebble stone, which lightened by her neck like diamond shone. She wear no gloves, for neither sun nor wind would burn or parch her hands, but to her mind or warm or cool them for they took delight to play upon those hands they were so white. Buskins of shells all silvered used she, and branched with blushing coral to the knee, where sparrows perched of hollow pearl and gold, such as the world would wonder to behold. Those with sweet water oft her handmaid fills, which as she went would chirrup to the bills. Some say for her the fairest Cupid bind, and looking in her face was struck and blind. But this is true so like was one the other as he imagined hero was his mother and oftentimes into her bosom flew about her naked neck his bare arms threw and laid his childish head upon her breast and with still panting rocked there took his rest so lovely fair was hero venus nun as nature wept thinking she was undone because she took more from her than she left and of such wondrous beauty her bereft Therefore in sign her treasure suffered rack, Since hero's time hath half the world been black. Amorous Leander, beautiful and young, Whose tragedy divine Museus sung, Dwelt at Abydos, since him dwelt there none For whom succeeding times make greater moan. His dangling tresses that were never shorn, Had they been cut and under Colchus born, Would have allured the venturous youth of Greece To hazard more than for the golden fleece. Fair Cynthia wished his arms might be her sphere. Grief makes her pale because she moves not there. His body was as straight as Circe's wand. Jove might have sipped out nectar from his hand. Even as delicious meat is to the taste, so was his neck in touching, and surpassed the white of Pelop's shoulder. I could tell ye how smooth his breast was, and how white his belly, and whose immortal fingers did imprint that heavenly path with many a curious dint that runs along his back. But my rude pen can hardly blazon forth the loves of men, much less of powerful gods. Let it suffice that my slack muse sings of Leander's eyes, those orient cheeks and lips exceeding his that leapt into the water for a kiss of his own shadow and despising many, died ere he could enjoy the love of any. At wild Hippolytus Leander seen, enamoured of his beauty had he been, his presence made the rudest peasant melt that in the vast uplandish country dwelt. The barbarous Thracian soldier moved with naught was moved with him, and for his favour sought. Some swore he was a maid in man's attire, for in his looks were all that men desire. A pleasant smiling cheek, a speaking eye, a brow for love to banquet royally. And such as knew he was a man, would say, Leander, thou art made for amorous play. Why art thou not in love, and loved of all? Though thou be fair, yet be not thine own thrall. 
The men of wealthy Cestus every year, for his sake whom their goddess held so dear, rose-cheeked Adonis, kept a solemn feast. Thither resorted many a wandering guest to meet their loves, such as had none at all came lovers home from this great festival. For every street like to a firmament glistered with breathing stars, who where they went frighted the melancholy earth, which deemed eternal heaven to burn, for so it seemed, as if another phaeton had got the guidance of the sun's rich chariot. But far above the loveliest hero shined, and stole away the enchanted gazer's mind. For like sea-nymphs in vagling harmony, so was her beauty to the standers by. Nor that night wandering pale and watery star, when yawning dragons draw her thirling car from Latmus Mount up to the gloomy sky, where, crowned with blazing light and majesty, she proudly sits, more overrules the flood than she the hearts of those that near her stood. Even as when gaudy nymphs pursue the chase, wretched Ixion's shaggy-footed race, incensed with savage heat, gallop amain from steep pine-bearing mountains to the plain, so ran the people forth to gaze upon her, and all that viewed her were enamoured on her. And as in fury of a dreadful fight, their fellows being slain or put to flight, poor soldiers stand with fear of death dead stricken, so at her presence all surprised and tooken await the sentence of her scornful eyes. He whom she favors lives, the other dies. There might you see one sigh, another rage, and some, their violent passions to assuage, compile sharp satires. But alas, too late, for faithful love will never turn to hate. And many, seeing great princes were denied, pined as they went, and thinking on her, died. On this feast day, O oh, cursed day and hour, went hero Thurisestus from her tower to Venus' temple, where, unhappily as after chanced, they did each other spy. So fair a church as this had Venus none. The walls were of discolored jasper stone, wherein was Proteus carved, and o'erhead a lively vine of green sea agate spread, where by one hand light-headed Bacchus hung, and with the other wine from grapes outrung. Of crystal shining fair the pavement was. The town of Cestus called it Venus Glass. There might you see the gods in sundry shapes committing heady riots, incest, rapes. For know that underneath this radiant floor was Dunny's statue in a brazen tower, Jove slyly stealing from his sister's bed to dally with the Delian Ganymede. And for his love Europa bellowing loud and tumbling with the rainbow in a cloud. Blood-quaffing Mars heaving the iron net which limping Vulcan with his cyclops set, Love kindling fire to burn such towns as Troy, Sylvanus weeping for the lovely boy that now is turned into a cypress tree, under whose shade the wood gods love to be. And in the midst a silver altar stood, there Hero, sacrificing turtle's blood, veiled to the ground, veiling her eyelids close, and modestly they opened as she rose. Thence flew love's arrow with the golden head, and thus Leander was enamoured. Stone still he stood, and evermore he gazed, till with the fire that from his countenance blazed, relenting hero's gentle heart was struck. Such force and virtue hath an amorous look. It lies not in our power to love or hate, for will in us is overruled by fate. When two are stripped long ere the course begin, we wish that one should lose, the other win. And one especially we do affect of two old ingots like in each respect. The reason no man knows. Let it suffice, what we behold is censured by our eyes. Where both deliberate, the love is slight. Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. He kneeled, but unto her devoutly prayed. Chaste hero to herself thus softly said, were I the saint he worships, I would hear him. And as she spake those words, came somewhat near him. He started up. She blushed as one ashamed, wherewith Leander much more was inflamed. He touched her hand. In touching it, she trembled. Love deeply grounded, hardly as dissembled. These lovers parted by the touch of hands. 
true love is mute, and oft amazed stands. Thus, while dumb signs their yielding hearts entangled, the air with sparks of living fire was spangled, and night, deep drenched in misty Acheron, heaved up her head, and half the world upon breathed darkness forth. Dark night is Cupid's day. And now begins Leander to display love's holy fire with words, with sighs, and tears, which, like sweet music, entered Hero's ears. And yet at every word she turned aside, and always cut him off as he replied. At last, like to a bold, sharp sophister, with cheerful hope, thus he accosted her. Fair creature, let me speak without offence. I would my rude words had the influence to lead thy thoughts as thy fair looks do mine. Then shouldst thou be his prisoner who is thine. Be not unkind and fair. Misshapen stuff are of behavior boisterous and rough. Oh, shun me not, but hear me ere you go. God knows I cannot force love as you do. My words shall be as spotless as my youth, full of simplicity and naked truth. This sacrifice, whose sweet perfume descending from Venus' altar to your footsteps bending, doth testify that you exceed her far to whom you offer, and whose none you are. Why should you worship her? Her you surpass as much as sparkling diamonds, flaring glass. A diamond set in lead his worth retains. A heavenly nymph, beloved of human swains, receives no blemish, but oft times more grace, which makes me hope although I am but base, base in respect of thee, divine and pure, dutiful service may thy love procure. And I in duty will excel all other, as thou in beauty dost exceed love's mother. Nor heaven nor thou were made to gaze upon. As heaven preserves all things, so save thou one. A stately builded ship, well rigged and tall, the ocean maketh more majestical, why vowest thou to live in Cestus here, who on love's seas more glorious wouldst appear? Like untuned golden strings all women are, which long time lie untouched, will harshly jar. Vessels of brass, oft handled, brightly shine. What difference betwixt the richest mine and basest mould but use? For both not used are of like worth. Then treasure is abused when misers keep it. Being put to loan, in time it will return us two for one. Rich robes themselves and others do adorn, neither themselves nor others if not worn. Who builds a palace and rams up the gate shall see it ruinous and desolate. Ah, simple hero, learn thyself to cherish. Lone women like to empty houses perish. Less sins the poor rich man that starves himself in heaping up a mass of drossy pelf than such as you. His golden earth remains, which, after his decease, some other gains. But this fair gem, sweet in the loss alone, when you fleet hence, can be bequeathed to none. Or if it could, down from an enameled sky all heaven would come to claim this legacy, and with intestine broils the world destroy, and quite confound nature's sweet harmony. Well, therefore, by the gods decreed it is, we human creatures should enjoy that bliss. One is no number. Maids are nothing then without the sweet society of men. Wilt thou live single still? One shalt thou be, though never singling hymen couple thee. Wild savages that drink of running springs think water far excels all earthly things. But they that daily taste neat wine despise it. Virginity, albeit some highly prize it, compared with marriage, had you tried them both, differs as much as wine and water doth. Base bullion for the stamp's sake we allow. Even so for men's impression do we you. By which alone our reverend fathers say, women receive perfection every way. This idol which you term virginity is neither essence subject to the eye, no, nor to any one exterior sense, nor hath it any place of residence, nor is it of earth or mould celestial or capable of any form at all. Of that which hath no being do not boast, Things that are not at all and ever lost. Men foolishly do call it virtuous. What virtue is it that is born with us? Much less can honor be ascribed thereto. Honor is purchased by the deeds we do. Believe me, hero, honor is not won until some honorable deed be done. Seek you for chastity, immortal fame, and know that some have wronged Diana's name. 
whose name is it if she be false or not so she be fair but some vile tongues will blot but you are fair i me so wondrous fair so young so gentle and so debonair as greece will think if thus you live alone some one or other keeps you as his own then hero hate me not nor from me fly to follow swiftly blasting infamy perhaps thy sacred priesthood makes thee loath tell me to whom madest thou that heedless oath to venus answered she and as she spake forth from those two trelucent cisterns break a stream of liquid pearl which down her face made milk-white paths whereon the gods might trace to jove's high court he thus replied the rites in which love's beauteous empress most delights are banquets doric music midnight revel plays masks and all that stern age counteth evil thee as a holy idiot doth she scorn for thou in vowing chastity hast sworn to rob her name and honor and thereby commit'st a sin far worse than perjury even sacrilege against her deity through regular and formal purity to expiate which sin kiss and shake hands such sacrifice as this venus demands thereat she smiled and did deny him so as put thereby yet might he hope for mo which makes him quickly reinforce his speech and her in humble manner thus beseech though neither gods nor men may thee deserve yet for her sake whom you have vowed to serve abandon fruitless cold virginity the gentle queen of love's sole enemy then shall you most resemble venus none when venus sweet rites are performed and done flint-breasted palace joys in single life but pallas and your mistress are at strife love hero then and be not tyrannous but heal the heart that thou hast wounded thus nor stain thy youthful years with avarice fair fools delight to be accounted nice the richest corn dies if it be not reaped beauty alone is lost too warily kept these arguments he used and many more wherewith she yielded that was won before hero's looks yielded but her words made war women are one when they begin to jar thus having swallowed cupid's golden hook the more she strived the deeper was she struck yet evilly feigning anger strove she still and would be thought to grant against her will so having paused a while at last she said who taught thee rhetoric to deceive a maid I me such words as these should I abhor, and yet I like them for the orator. With that Leander stooped to have embraced her, but from his spreading arms away she cast her, and thus bespake him, Gentle youth, forbear to touch the sacred garments which I wear. Upon a rock, and underneath a hill, far from the town, where all is whist and still save that the sea playing on yellow sand sends forth a rattling murmur to the land whose sound allures the golden morpheus in silence of the night to visit us my turret stands and there god knows i play with venus swans and sparrows all the day a dwarfish beldam bears me company that hops about the chamber where i lie and spends the night that might be better spent in vain discourse and apish merriment come thither as she spake this her tongue tripped for unwares come thither from her slipped and suddenly her former colour changed and here and there her eyes through anger ranged and like a planet moving several ways at one self instant she poor soul essays loving not to love at all and every part strove to resist the motions of her heart and hands so pure so innocent nay such as might have made heaven stoop to have a touch did she uphold to venus and again vowed spotless chastity but all in vain cupid beats down her prayers with his wings her vows above the empty air he flings all deep enraged his sinewy bow he bent and shot a shaft that burning from him went wherewith she strooken looked so dolefully as made love sigh to see his tyranny and as she wept her tears to pearly turned and wound them on his arm 
and for her mourned. Then, towards the palace of the destinies, laden with languishment and grief, he flies, and to those stern nymphs humbly made request, both might enjoy each other and be blessed. But with a ghastly, dreadful countenance, threatening a thousand deaths at every glance, they answered love, nor would vouchsafe so much as one poor word. Their hate to him was such. Hearken a while, and I will tell you why. Heaven's winged herald, Jove-born Mercury, the selfsame day that he asleep had laid enchanted Argus, spied a country maid, whose careless hair, instead of pearl to adorn it, glistered with dew, as one that seemed to scorn it. Her breath, as fragrant as the morning rose, her mind pure and her tongue untaught to glows. Yet proud she was, for lofty pride that dwells in towered courts is oft in shepherd's cells and too too well the fair vermilion knew and silver tincture of her cheeks that drew the love of every swain on her this god enamoured was and with his snaky rod did charm her nimble feet and made her stay the while upon a hillock down he lay and sweetly on his pipe began to play and with smooth speech her fancy to essay till in his twining arms he locked her fast and then he wooed with kisses, and at last, as shepherds do, her on the ground he laid, and tumbling in the grass he often strayed beyond the bounds of shame in being bold to eye those parts which no eye should behold. And like an insolent commanding lover, boasting his parentage, would needs discover the way to new Elysium. But she, whose only dower was her chastity, having striven in vain, was now about to cry, and crave the help of shepherds that were nigh. Herewith he stayed his fury, and began to give her leave to rise. Away she ran, after went Mercury, who used such cunning as she, to hear his tale, left off her running. Maids are not won by brutish force and might, but speeches full of pleasure and delight. And knowing Hermes courted her, was glad that she such loveliness and beauty had as could provoke his liking, yet was mute, and neither would deny nor grant his suit still vowed he love she wanting no excuse to feed him with delays as women use or thirsting after immortality all women are ambitious naturally imposed upon her lover such a task as he ought not perform nor yet she ask a draught of flowing nectar she requested wherewith the king of gods and men is feasted he ready to accomplish what she willed stole some from hebe hebe jove's cup filled and gave it to his simple rustic love. Which being known, as what is hid from Jove, he inly stormed and waxed more furious than for the fire filched by Prometheus, and thrusts him down from heaven. He, wandering here, in mournful terms, with sad and heavy cheer, complained to Cupid. Cupid, for his sake, to be revenged on Jove, did undertake, and those on whom heaven, earth, and hell relies, I mean the adamantine destinies, he wounds with love, and forced them equally to dote upon deceitful Mercury. They offered him the deadly, fatal knife that shears the slender threads of human life. At his fair feathered feet the engines laid, which thirth from ugly chaos then upweighed. These he regarded not, but did entreat that Jove, usurper of his father's seat, might presently be banished into hell, and aged Saturn in Olympus dwell. They granted what he craved, and once again Saturn and Ops began their golden reign. Murder, rape, war, lust, and treachery were with Jove closed in Stygian empery. But long this blessed time continued not. As soon as he his wished purpose got, he, reckless of his promise, did despise the love of the everlasting destinies. They, seeing it, both love and him abhorred, and Jupiter unto his place restored, and, but that learning, in despite of fate, will mount aloft, and enter heaven gate, and to the seat of Jove itself advance, Hermes had slept in hell with ignorance. Yet, as a punishment, they added this, that he and poverty should always kiss. And to this day is every scholar poor. Gross gold from them runs headlong to the boor. 
likewise the angry sisters thus deluded to venge themselves on hermes have concluded that midas brood shall sit in honor's chair to which the muses sons are only heir and fruitful wits that in aspiring are shall discontent run into regions far and few great lords in virtuous deeds shall joy but be surprised with every garish toy and still enrich the lofty servile clown who with encroaching guile keeps learning down then muse not cupid's suit no better sped seeing in their loves the fates were injured end of the first cestiate The second cestiad of Hero and Leander by Christopher Marlowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The second cestiad. By this sad hero, with love unacquainted, viewing Leander's face, fell down and fainted. He kissed her and breathed life into her lips, wherewith, as one displeased, away she trips. Yet as she went full often looked behind and many poor excuses did she find to linger by the way and once she stayed and would have turned again but was afraid in offering parley to be counted light so on she goes and in her idle flight her painted fan of curled plumes let fall thinking to train leander therewithal he being a novice knew not what she meant but stayed and after her a letter sent which joyful hero answered in such sort as he had hoped to scale the beauteous fort wherein the liberal graces locked their wealth and therefore to her tower he got by stealth wide open stood the door he need not climb and she herself before the pointed time had spread the board with roses strode the room and oft looked out and mused he did not come at last he came oh who can tell the greeting these greedy lovers had at their first meeting he asked, she gave, and nothing was denied. Both to each other quickly were affied. Look how their hands, so were their hearts united, and what he did she willingly requited. Sweet are the kisses, the embracements sweet, when like desires and affections meet. For from the earth to heaven is Cupid raised, where fancy is in equal balance paced. Yet she this rashness suddenly repented, and turned aside, and to herself lamented, as if her name and honor had been wronged by being possessed of him for whom she longed. Ay, and she wished, albeit not from her heart, that he would leave her turret and depart. The mirthful god of amorous pleasure smiled to see how he this captive nymph beguiled, for hitherto he did but fan the fire, and kept it down that it might mount the higher. Now waxed she jealous, lest his love abated, fearing her own thoughts made her to be hated. Therefore unto him hastily she goes, and light like Salmasus, her body throws upon his bosom, where with yielding eyes she offers up herself a sacrifice to slake his anger if he were displeased. Oh, what god would not therewith be appeased? Like Aesop's cock this jewel he enjoyed, and as a brother with his sister toyed, supposing nothing else was to be done now he her favor and good will had won but know you not that creatures wanting sense by nature have a mutual appetence and wanting organs to advance a step moved by love's force unto each other lep much more in subjects having intellect some hidden influence breeds like effect albeit leander rude in love and raw long dallying with hero nothing saw that might delight him more yet he suspected some amorous rites or other were neglected therefore unto his body hers he clung she fearing on the rushes to be flung strived with redoubled strength the more she strived the more a gentle pleasing heat revived which taught him all that elder lovers know and now the same gan so to scorch and glow as in plain terms yet cunningly he craved it love always makes those eloquent that have it she with a kind of granting put him by it and ever as he thought himself most nigh it like to the tree of tantalus she fled and seeming lavish saved her maidenhead ne'er king more sought to keep his diadem than hero this inestimable gem above our life we love a steadfast friend yet 
when a token of great worth we send we often kiss it often look thereon and stay the messenger that would be gone no marvel then though hero would not yield so soon to part from that she dearly held jewels being lost are found again this never tis lost but once and once lost lost for ever now had the morn espied her lover's steeds whereat she starts pulls on her purple weeds and red for anger that he stayed so long all headlong throws herself the clouds among and now leander fearing to be missed embraced her suddenly took leave and kissed long was he taking leave and loath to go and kissed again as lovers used to do sad hero wrung him by the hand and wept saying let your vows and promises be kept then standing at the door she turned about as loath to see leander going out and now the sun that through the rise and peeps as pitying these lovers downward creeps so that in silence of the cloudy night though it was morning did he take his flight but what the secret trusty knight concealed leander's amorous habit soon revealed with cupid's myrtle was his bonnet crowned about his arms the purple ribbon wound wherewith she wreathed her largely spreading hair nor could the youth abstain but he must wear the sacred ring wherewith she was endowed when first religious chastity she vowed which made his love through cestus to be known and thence unto abida sooner blown than he could sail for incorporeal fame whose weight consists in nothing but her name is swifter than the wind whose tardy plumes are reeking water and dull earthly fumes home when he came he seemed not to be there but like exiled air thrust from his fear set in a foreign place and straight from thence alcides like by mighty violence he would have chased away the swelling mane that him from her unjustly did detain like as the sun in a diameter fires and it flames objects removed far and heateth kindly shining laterally so beauty sweetly quickens when tis nigh but being separated and removed burns where it cherished murders where it loved therefore even as an index to a book so to his mind was young leander's look o oh, none but gods have power their love to hide affection by the countenance is descried the light of hidden fire itself discovers and love that is concealed betrays poor lovers his secret flame apparently was seen leander's father knew where he had been and for the same mildly rebuked his son thinking to quench the sparkles new begun but love resisted once grows passionate and nothing more than counsel lovers hate for as a hot proud horse highly disdains to have his head controlled but breaks the reins spits forth the wrinkled bit and with his hooves checks the submissive ground so he that loves the more he is restrained the worse he fares what is it now but mad leander dares o oh, hero hero thus he cried full oft and then he got him to a rock aloft where having spied her tower long stared he on't and prayed the narrow toiling hellespont to part in twain that he might come and go but still the rising billows answered no with that he stripped him to the ivory skin and crying love i come leapt lively in whereat the sapphire visaged god grew proud and made his capering triton sound aloud imagining that ganymede displeased had left the heavens therefore on him he seized leander strived the waves about him wound and pulled him to the bottom where the ground was strewed with pearl and in low coral groves sweet singing mermaids sported with their loves on heaps of heavy gold and took great pleasure to spurn in careless sort the shipwrecked treasure for here the stately azure palace stood where kingly neptune and his train abode the lusty god embraced him called him love and swore he never should return to jove but when he knew it was not ganymed for under water he was almost dead he heaved him up and looking on his face beat down the bold waves with his triple mace which mounted up intending to have kissed him and fell in drops like tears because they missed him leander being up began to swim and looking back saw neptune follow him 
whereat aghast the poor soul gan to cry oh let me visit hero ere i die the god put helly's bracelet on his arm and swore the sea should never do him harm he clapped his plump cheeks with his tresses played and smiling wantonly his love bewrayed he watched his arms and as they opened wide at every stroke betwixt them would he slide and steal a kiss and then run out and dance and as he turned cast many a lustful glance and threw him gaudy toys to please his eye and dive into the water and there pry upon his breast his thighs and every limb and up again and close beside him swim and talk of love leander made reply you are deceived i am no woman i thereat smiled neptune and then told a tale how that a shepherd sitting in a vale played with a boy so fair and kind as for his love both earth and heaven pined that of the cooling river durst not drink lest water nymphs should pull him from the brink and when he sported in the fragrant lawns goat-footed satyrs and upstaring fawns would steal him thence ere half this tale was done i me leander cried the enamoured sun that now should shine on thetis glassy bower descends upon my radiant hero's tower oh that these tardy arms of mine were wings and as he spake upon the waves he springs neptune was angry that he gave no ear and in his heart revenging malice bear he flung at him his mace but as it went he called it in for love made him repent the mace returning back his own hand hit as meaning to be avenged for darting it when this fresh bleeding wound leander viewed his color went and came as if he rued the grief which neptune felt in gentle breasts relenting thoughts remorse and pity rests and who have hard hearts and obdurate minds but vicious hair-brained and illiterate hinds the god seeing him with pity to be moved thereon concluded that he was beloved love is too full of faith too credulous with folly and false hope deluding us wherefore leander's fancy to surprise to the rich ocean for gifts he flies tis wisdom to give much a gift prevails when deep persuading oratory fails by this leander being near the land cast down his weary feet and felt the sand breathless albeit he were he rested not till to the solitary tower he got and knocked and called at which celestial noise the longing heart of hero much more joys than nymphs and shepherds when the timbrel rings or crooked dolphin when the sailor sings she stayed not for her robes but straight arose and drunk with gladness to the door she goes where seeing a naked man she screeched for fear such sights as this to tender maids are rare and ran into the dark herself to hide which jewels in the dark are soonest spied and to earth was he led or rather drawn by those white limbs which sparkled through the lawn the nearer that he came the more she fled and seeking refuge slipped into her bed whereon leander sitting thus began through numbing cold all feeble faint and wan if not for love yet love for pity's sake me in thy bed and maiden bosom take at least vouchsafe these arms some little room who hoping to embrace thee cheerly swum this head was beat with many a churlish billow and therefore let it rest upon thy pillow herewith affrighted hero shrunk away and in her lukewarm place leander lay whose lively heat like fire from heaven fet would animate gross clay and higher set the drooping thoughts of base declining souls than dreary mars carousing nectar bowls his hands he cast upon her like a snare she overcome with shame and sallow fear like chaste diana when actaean spied her being suddenly betrayed dived down to hide her and as her silver body downward went with both her hands she made the bed a tent and in her own mind thought herself secure or cast with dim and darksome coverture and now she lets him whisper in her ear flatter and treat promise protest and swear yet ever as he greedily essayed to touch those dainties she the harpy played and every limb did as a soldier stout defend the fort and keep the foeman out for though the rising ivory mount he scaled which is with azure circling lines impaled much like a globe a globe may i term this by which love sails to regions full of bliss 
yet there with sisyphus he toiled in vain till gentle parley did the truce obtain wherein leander on her quivering breast breathless spoke something and sighed out the rest which so prevailed as he with small ado enclosed her in his arms and kissed her too and every kiss to her was as a charm and to leander as a fresh alarm so that the truce was broke and she alas poor silly maiden at his mercy was love is not full of pity as men say but deaf and cruel where he means to pray even as a bird which in our hands we wring forth plungeth and oft flutters with her wing she trembling strove this strife of hers like that which made the world another world begat of unknown joy treason was in her thought and cunningly to yield herself she sought seeming not one yet one she was at length in such wars women used but half their strength leander now like theban hercules entered the orchard of the sparides whose fruit none rightly can describe but he that pulls or shakes it from the golden tree and now she wished this night were never done and sighed to think upon the approaching sun for much it grieved her that the bright daylight should know the pleasure of this blessed night and them like mars and erison display both in each other's arms chained as they lay again she knew not how to frame her look or speak to him who in a moment took that which so long so charily she kept and fain by stealth away she would have crept and to some corner secretly have gone leaving leander in the bed alone but as her naked feet were whipping out he on the sudden clinged her so about that mermaid-like unto the floor she slid one half appeared the other half was hid thus near the bed she blushing stood upright and from her countenance behold ye might a kind of twilight break which through the hair as from an orient cloud glimpsed here and there and round about the chamber this false morn brought forth the day before the day was born so hero's ruddy cheek hero betrayed and her all naked to his sight displayed whence his admiring eyes more pleasure took than dece on heaps of gold fixing his look by this apollo's golden harp began to sound forth music to the ocean which watchful hesperus no sooner heard but he the bright day-bearing car prepared and ran before as harbinger of light and with his flaring beams mocked ugly night till she or come with anguish shame and rage dang down to hell her loathsome carriage end of the second sestiate recording by thomas copeland end of hero and leander by christopher marlowe